This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. The return of Babylon. Welcome to a view from the bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining me today is a young man who's uh, been on the program previously, but it's been almost three years since we've had him on. And uh, this is a follow-up book to the subject of our previous discussion. And uh, this is right in our wheelhouse because it's really what this whole supernatural war is about, the end game. And we're certainly seeing it play out in the headlines around us. The Return of Babylon, just one aspect of the uh, the book. Uh, this young man is the uh, pastor at Fort Oglethorpe Church of Christ. His previous book, Gospel Over Gods, the new book, Gate of the Gods, coming from Defender Publishing. And you'll see him soon on Skywatch TV. So we're happy to have the scoop here and get him on first. Uh, we welcome back to the program, Tyler Gilreath. Tyler, uh, Tyler, good to see you again, brother. Derek, it is so good to see you. Uh, I've been looking forward to getting back on your podcast and uh, appreciate the the gracious invitation. Um, you know how it is when you launch a new book, uh, you're just happy to get the word out to spread uh, all the hard work you've done and hopefully bless people's lives spiritually and to talk about a very important subject that I think a lot of people are mindful of, especially today more than ever, and that is the uh, the book of Revelation. So looking yeah. forward to our discussion. You are rather unique in uh, being a pastor who not only uh, – dives into the book of Revelation, but also holds to the divine counsel worldview that uh, the late Dr. Michael Heiser really has educated so many of us about, uh, educated so many of us too. I mean, the existence of other entities in the spirit realm that were called Elohim, gods, by the Hebrew prophets. I mean, for English speakers, that's sort of like, a, like, wait a minute, there's only one God. Well, yeah, that's because we conflate capital G-O-D, Yahweh, with these lesser Elohim. Um, just b before we dive into the book specifically, uh, how does your congregation deal with this? How, how have they responded to teachings on the existence of other Elohim? Well, my experience has been pretty good. Um, we're actually, I'm actually taking the congregation through this book right now, Gate of the Gods. Um, and that, of course, comes with a, a backdrop that we've already been through. My first book, which uh, you alluded to, the work of Dr. Michael S. Heiser. Um, and how in my first book, it's more of a chronological study. Uh, it has a narrative feel to it, but also it deals with various subjects at appropriate times in the book. But uh, they had a, a rich history, I guess you'd say, of uh, what really happened in the ancient world and what's still happening before we delve into the book of Revelation. And uh, I'll be honest, you know, before I really took the time to investigate the supernatural in the Bible, I felt ill-equipped to teach the book of Revelation. Um, I avoided, I avoided teaching Revelation for years of my ministry because I didn't have that foundation. And I'm of the mindset, if I truly don't understand what's going on, I'm not going to teach up, teach about it. You know, Paul says, you know, let's not be many teachers knowing we shall receive the stricter judgment. And I felt like at the time I wasn't ready, but again, recovering the supernatural worldview that the ancient Jews had, the ancient Christians, um, studying the book of Revelation with the thoroughness that I have, the in-depth uh, investigation, I feel like I'm at a place, and I'm sure you are as well, many of your listeners, um, to where I'm hungry to know more about the supernatural, uh, because the book of Revelation is the most supernatural book in all the New Testament. And again, it's something that people in congregations right now are having questions about. And so I'm very excited uh, to take my congregation through this material and in hopes that the material will spread well beyond uh, my part of the world. And mm. being on your program certainly helps that. Well, we, we can hope anyway. Um, I, I see that in the introduction to your book, Gate of the Gods, you do what Sharon and I did with our program, Unraveling Revelation, where we started in the Old Testament. Where do you see Revelation or the Old Testament in Revelation? Well, simply put, it's everywhere. 
It is on every page. Um, I do spend some time in the introduction of the book kind of talking about the uh, how John uses the book of Revelation. He uses it in various ways. Um, one way he doesn't use it is he doesn't say, well, this is written in the prophets and then quote a citation from the prophets, uh, an obvious illusion, in other words. And so one reason why I think most people are just unaware that the Old Testament is embedded in the very DNA of the book of Revelation is because uh, there's not obvious illusions. Um, and so you really have to do some hard studying, some hard work, looking for specific phrases, looking for specific words, looking for themes um, to really figure out what in the world is going on. And um, so I talk about that. I feel like that was kind of the foundation of the book of Revelation. And without understanding that the Hebrew prophets are very much uh at what's in view in the book of Revelation and their writings. Uh, the reader of Revelation is going to be in the dark. And so to me, that was a fundamental piece that I couldn't not discuss. Now, kind of the aim of the book is not just looking at the Old Testament in the book of Revelation, uh, but it's looking specifically at the identity of Babylon the Great. And uh, I'm sure we're going to get into that uh, throughout this discussion. But um, but yeah, the Old Testament is everywhere. Uh, one term I use in the book, and I don't even know if this was original to me or not, but what John does in the book is called blender theology. In other words, picture a uh, smoothie. You put different fruits in there, uh, bananas, you put blueberries, you may even throw some peanut butter in there or whatever, and you hit the start button and what comes out is this warm, juicy, nutritious smoothie. Well, that's how the book of Revelation is. John utilizes various scriptures in any given section, throws them into a blender, hits the start button, and what comes out is a conglomerate of various Old Testament concepts, ideas, and prophecies. And so that is really the uh, foundation of the apocalypse. So in other words, you cannot separate, as a Christian, you cannot separate yourself from the uh, Old Testament, even if you want to. That's that's precisely correct. Um, you know, <laughs> we don't need to divorce ourselves from the story and the prophecies <laughs> uh, that, that have come before us. They're very much a part. Uh, and I know we don't certainly practice, uh, you know, Jewish practices uh, on the scale that they do. And, and there's some differences. We understand that. Um, but I kind of look at it like a, a story or a book. If you picked up a, a fiction book and started reading it, you wouldn't tear out the first half of the book because that's really the foundation for the latter part of the book. And uh, the Bible is a story. And so uh, we don't need to throw out you know, much of the Bible at all, because that is the uh, the prehistory of, of the world. That is the uh, the history of the Jewish people. That is eventually what will bring the Messiah uh, to be the second Adam and to save us from our sins. And so um, I view the Bible very much as a, a narrative, a historical narrative, a true narrative uh, that continues through the book of Revelation. And uh, Revelation is a book ends. It's how the Bible ends. And so it makes sense that John would rabbit trail back and revisit uh, various books of the Bible that have come before it to talk about how things will end. And that's exactly what uh, John does in Revelation. He sees his writing as uh, the other side of the book end, where Genesis would be the beginning and Revelation would be the end. And so it's a masterpiece. Revelation is a masterpiece. Uh, it's a master class in uh, theology. It's a master class in uh, intertextuality on how to use other scriptures and to weave those into your own. Of course, we know that John actually saw the vision that he saw and actually had the experience. But um, to try to paint Revelation as just a simple 
book is really a mistake. It, it is truly so deep. Uh, we can search until we die and we will never find every answer, but I certainly did uh, my part, the best I could do in the book to bring out some key themes that I felt like were important in understanding, um, again, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. Mm. And it's uh, it's a little more complicated than than some of the uh, uh, skeptics will just dismiss it as the um, uh, hallucinations of an elderly man uh, suffering from the deprivations of solitary confinement on the Isle of Patmos or or whatever or uh, right. <laughs> As one uh, researcher recently suggested that it was uh, due to, uh, you know, ingesting DMT or something, uh, you know, magic mushrooms. <laughs> one of the uh, the interesting aspects of your book, um, Gate of the Gods, is your identification of Babel as Babylon. Uh, I, th- I don't think most English speakers, and I, I confess I didn't either until I started looking at the the Hebrew. I don't read or speak Hebrew, but I've got a lot of great electronic tools that help uh, help me with that uh, handicap, that the Hebrew for Babel is the same exact word that is translated as Babylon in the Old Testament. And so you've got to look at context. Um, and Sharon and I have been doing exactly this in our study of Unraveling Revelation, connecting Babel, the gate of the gods, with Babylon. How did you come to make that, uh, how did you come to that conclusion and what uh, then implications does that have for understanding Babylon the Great or Mystery Babylon in Revelation? You know, I, I probably like most folks, you know, had kind of a background in understanding um, Babylon the Great was just Rome. Um, and understandably so, you know, I even admit in the uh, introduction of the book, that um, John and the early church, it's indisputable that they saw Rome as a second, uh, as a modern day Babylon. Okay. And so I'm not dismissing the presence of Rome in the book. I'm just not spending time looking for Roman threads. There's been hundreds of books that have already done that. Um, But what I'm, what I'm asking in the book and what I'm trying to set forth is the fact that there is more to see than just Rome. Uh, Rome was a modern day puppet, uh, the uh, fallen angels from the Tower of Babel uh, are behind the uh, driving force of chaos amongst the nations. And so when you begin to investigate that and you understand the uh, how important the uh, Deuteronomy 32 worldview uh, is to the biblical narrative, then there has to be a resolution for that. And one thing Jesus does and did on his earthly ministry is he would interact with those three divine rebellions by visiting certain sites, by saying certain things, certain ways. And Revelation does that as well. Um, It interacts with those three divine rebellions in uh, really head on. It hits them head on. And so I guess one thing that is amazing to me is the lack of, uh, books or resources investigating Babylon as Babylon. And Babel, Babylon is inseparable from the Babel event. Okay. There's actually a history that we have recovered that we can actually march through time and show from Babel to Babylon. The uh, Babylonians called their city uh, several different things. Uh, Babali, Babalu, or Babylonian, and it means gate of the gods. And so that is why the book is named Gate of the Gods, uh, is because it takes John at his word and says, okay, he says Babylon the Great is this cosmic enemy. Well, let's look for Babylonian threads in the book of Revelation. And that's what the book does. It looks for Babylonian threads all the way throughout, uh, because again, we have to bring down Babylon, Christ, the Messiah. How are we going to do that? And one way is we're going to dismantle Babylon the Great across the board. Sure, we're literally going to bring those gods to justice, but we're going to do more than that. 
We're going to tear down their literature, their creation stories. We're going to uh, dip into their astrology because there are astral prophecies in the book of Revelation. Um, you know, so, so, so John does that throughout the book. And so um, that is, again, right there in the text. We're not making this up. There are astral prophecies. There are mentions of beasts. Um, there are so many things that connect to Babylon the Great. So um, to answer your question, uh, we have to resolve the Babel event. And John does so in the book of Revelation by dipping into Babylonian uh, literature throughout the book. Yeah, and and imagery too. Um, the exactly. uh, just to just to lay a little groundwork for people who may not be familiar, you mentioned uh, two things. I would like you to explain just a little bit, just in case people don't have the background. Uh, three rebellions in Scripture. Again, most of us Christians think, okay, the fall in the garden, that's it, and then uh, the Deuteronomy thirty-two worldview. If you could explain those so that people would uh, understand what we're talking about. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, like you said, the Genesis three rebellion. Uh, people are you know, familiar with that, uh, the serpent, the Nahash, um, the shining one, the burning one. Uh, but then there are other rebel rebels that follow, uh, in his steps. And, uh, of course the second one would be the, uh, Genesis six, one through four rebellion of the B'nai Ha Elohim or the sons of God, uh, who descended, uh, upon the earth to a uh, location called Mount Hermon, uh, near Caesarea Philippi. And, um, of course it was Bashan in the old Testament or Bashan in the old Testament. And, um, they did a lot of things that were evil and accelerated wickedness upon the earth. Simply put, they, uh, you know, introduced to man, uh, weapon making, uh, metallurgy seduction for the women, uh, astrology, uh, which we'll talk about later um, in this interview, I'm sure. Um, and then they cohabitated or co-mingled with women, uh, which was uh, forbidden. And um, from their offspring, the Nephilim were born, uh, the uh, mighty men or the giants uh, of old, who are, uh, you know, very much antipodal to God's plan of uh being imagers on the earth. And so that was the second divine rebellion. God took care of that with the flood and the angels who sinned. He locked uh, in Tartarus uh, under gloomy chains of darkness, as it is said in uh, the uh, book of Enoch, first Enoch. Mm -hmm. And then the third divine rebellion, again, is the uh, some more B'nai Ha Elohim or more sons of God uh, rebelled in uh, the Tower of Babel event, where God uh, was displeased with Nimrod, the ancient builder of the ancient cities of the world, uh, and his followers who erected a, a temple structure uh, that gets referred to as the Tower of Babel, which was simply a, uh, we now know as a ziggurat structure, uh, a temple in which you would uh, call the deity to you or localize the presence of the deity. And um, God and his angels came down. It did get their attention. Um, and God assigned and divorced the nations and assigned them uh, spirit shepherds, if you will, or angels to watch over the nations, uh, assumingly until he is ready to take them back. And, um, uh, we know from scripture that it is those angels that also rebelled against Yahweh, the creator and uh, led the nations into darkness. And the psalmist uh, Asaph in Psalm 82 uh, is asking that God take back the nations and punish the rebel gods for leading the nations astray. And the promise is that, uh, he says, I said, you were God's sons of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like mortals, you will die and fall like any prince. Mm -hmm. And so that would be the, uh, the third divine rebellion, which has already, but not yet been taken care of. Um, their authority has been 
stripped away from them uh, and, and handed over to Jesus, who has all authority on heaven and on earth. But they are still present. They are still here. And they are still leading the nations astray. And they are the engine of chaos in the book of Revelation. It's uh, and this uh, the the Deuteronomy thirty two references because in Deuteronomy thirty two verse eight where Moses is retelling the Israelites their history and really the history of the world he points out that when the Most High God Yahweh gave to the nations their inheritance when he divided mankind after Babel he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God now the older King James translation translates it number of the sons of Israel but uh, the Septuagint translation, which was rendered into Greek from an older Hebrew text by about 200 BC, it's pretty clear that Jewish scholars in the Second Temple period, which would include the time of Jesus and the disciples, understood what was meant there because they rendered it the angels of God, divided the nations according to the number of the angels of God. And uh, it's interesting when you read the early church fathers, it's, it's pretty clear they understood that that was how this was to be read. But even in the pre-flood era, that God had entrusted angels with the administering of his creation and that they allowed themselves to be tempted into sin by the beauty of women. Now, maybe that's, you know, the early church fathers trying to, okay, women are so beautiful that they, they, you know, caused the angels to sin. I, I think the uh, angels were uh, the, the sons of God, the watchers in uh, Genesis six were a little more um, active in that rebellion. It wasn't so much that they were tempted to sin as they thought, I think, uh, my, my interpretation is that they thought this would be a way to take away dominion of the earth from the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. But uh, either way, you've got that pre-flood rebellion, and then you've got the post-flood rebellion of the angels. It, it's almost like when God gave the Israelites a king. You know, we want to be like all the other nations. Give us a king. And so God said to Samuel, okay, you go ahead and do it, but they're not going to like it. So he gave them yeah. a king, so they'd be like all the, okay, you want to have gods like that? Okay, uh, fine, you'll have all of these, but I'm going to call one nation out for myself because those who follow you are not going to be happy with the way you rule. And that's clear in Psalm 82, which is like a courtroom scene in heaven um, where God basically renders right. judgment. We're just waiting for sentence to be carried out here on this, uh, this earth. Um, so this really makes things a lot more... Um, interesting in the book of Revelation. My my introduction to Revelation was um, really Hal Lindsey. You know, my dad bought a copy of the late great planet Earth and um, reading that and, and looking at the, uh, uh, the, the analysis of, uh, you know, the war of Gog and Magog and uh, the things coming out of the abyss in Revelation 9, it looked like a, just a geopolitical firestorm here on Earth, which will be part of it, but it's sort of de-supernaturalized the uh, the whole book of Revelation into humans who were doing things that were perhaps demonic, but you didn't see the active participation of these uh, these spirit entities. Um, and, and we'll come back to that because you've got a chapter on the release of the Apkalu, and I think I know where you're going with that because I think we're on the same page regarding that. But uh, Jesus in the Underworld, uh, chapter three of your book, Gate of the Gods, uh, this is something alluded to by Peter in First Peter 3, and Mike Heiser's done some teaching on this. Uh, what is your take on Jesus descending, part of the Apostles' Creed? He descended into hell, and on the third day rose again. Um, what, what did he do there? Who did he encounter? What, it, what was the purpose of that? Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, you know, Peter, Peter does allude to that, um, where he sees uh, Jesus as a— uh, kind of a, uh, an Enoch figure um, that ascends down to the underworld uh, upon his death and uh, interacts with, you know, various beings. And uh, the beings that uh, Peter would allude to were, of course, uh, you know, the spirits in prison, uh, a very specific phrase that uh, is found in the book of Enoch uh, and not elsewhere. Oh. And so uh, that was certainly a message Jesus um, had to them. And the message that he preached was not a message of repent and be saved. Uh, it was, uh, I won, you lost, uh, you're still condemned, and I'm about to leave, I'm about to get out of here. Uh, there's different types of preaching, um, and that's the message that undoubtedly Jesus had. Uh, but in the book, I particularly just deal with that in general. And, and, you know, there's passages like Revelation 118 
where the Bible says that uh, Jesus now holds the uh, keys of death and Hades. And so there's entities, you know, named entities in uh, the book of Revelation that Jesus sparred with uh, for authority of the underworld keys. And uh, that may seem like a shock, you know, to a lot of people that um, Jesus would actually interact with these beings. And, you know, some of these beings like Hades are, uh, you know, beings that are found in Greek mythology and, and elsewhere. And uh, what I've come to realize, and I'm sure you as, as well, Derek, is uh, these deities uh, get recognized by various names um, through different civilizations. And uh, for example, um, death is an Old Testament uh, entity and uh, ancient Near Eastern in entity uh, where the Hebrews call Maveth. And uh, elsewhere, uh, he's called uh, Mot or Mot in uh, the Canaanite texts. And so we see scriptures in the Old Testament where Maveth is personified as a being. Right. And we see in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul uh, is beginning to talk about the resurrection and he begins to ask, you know, questions in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 55. He says, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Um, that is one of the most famous funeral verses of all time. But little do most people understand uh, he's actually talking about specific entities there because he's quoting from Hosea 13, 14, mm -hmm. where Hosea 13, 14 says, I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol. I shall redeem them from Maveth or buy them back from Maveth. Oh, Maveth, where is your Deber? Deber was a, uh, a demon. Yep. who was seen as uh, an escort of uh, Maveth. And then, and then the passage continues, O Sheol, where is your Keteb, another demonic entity? And so, you, you know, the English very much masks these entities in a lot of, a lot of passages and a lot of verses. And so when we get to the Revelation passage where, you know, Jesus is winning or stripping the keys away from, death and Hades, uh, I see that as a literal victory over literal entities. And so uh, I talk about that in, uh, like, like you mentioned in uh, chapter three of my book. Um, of course, there's some other passages that also mention death and Hades, Revelation 6, 8, where it says, I looked and behold a pale green horse and the one seated on it was named death and Hades. Uh, Revelation 20, 13, and 14, and the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. Mm -hmm. And so, again, John saw real defeats over real real enemies. And so I, I thought it was important to uh, point that out in the book of Revelation, that the, the entities that are named uh, are real and not figurative. No, I, I agree 100%, and I think that's why uh, Paul also mentions uh, death is swallowed up in victory, because the depiction, as you point out in your book, citing some of the Ugaritic texts, Ugarit being an Amorite kingdom in uh, what is now western Syria on the Mediterranean coast, um, was described as this uh, in, having this insatiable hunger and this this mouth where the uh, his lower lip drags the earth and his, his tongue reaches the stars, uh, so uh, death being swallowed up in victory is a another reversal of how these these pagan entities were were depicted in the Old Testament by the Hebrew prophets. Um, I think it's interesting too. You see the parallels, the references to death, maveth, sheol, uh, which uh, I would uh, equate with Thanatos and with Hades in the Greek. Thanatos being the name of the rider on the pale horse, and then Abaddon. I think is a cognate to Tartarus. And I'm not finding any scholarly confirmation of that. So I may be out on a limb there sawing it off behind me, but uh, you see references to Shale and Abaddon 
a couple of places in the Old Testament that would seem to parallel Hades and Tartarus in, in the Greek. But uh, I, I don't know that there is a uh, an actual Old Testament cognate to the bottomless pit. I've argued that there is, but uh, again, like I said, I'm alone out there. So either the Lord's shown me something new or I'm just way out in left field all by myself. Um, <laughs> speaking of the bottomless pit, I, I want to dive into that. And then we're going to come back to uh, Babel and the whole you know, gate of the gods and how this relates to the end times. Um, you have a chapter on the release of the Apkalu. And this kind of gets back to what I'd mentioned earlier with um, Hal Lindsey. And God bless him for encouraging people to get interested and excited in uh, end times prophecy again. Uh, he was responsible for a lot of people beginning to dig back into this. Um, in fact, it was Hal Lindsey who led uh, Chuck Missler to the Lord, got Chuck Missler involved in teaching Bible, uh, which has been a blessing to many of us. Um, the Apkalu, who were they and how do they figure into the book of Revelation? Well, again, we're looking to identify Babylon the Great. And uh, essentially, I argue in the book that uh, the Apkalu are the uh, watchers. Okay. Uh, of course, we expect Babylonians to call them in Babylonian names uh, as we you know, obviously do in our own language with our own uh, understandings of things. And uh, in fact, we do see the word watchers one time in the Old Testament or one time in the Bible. Uh, it's in the uh, book of Daniel. And we know Daniel was, uh, of course, uh, carried away into uh, Babylonian captivity. And so we do see, you know, that term, that's a Babylonian term uh, that they would have applied to these entities called the Apkalu, which were uh, essential, essentially uh, culture heroes before the flood, if you will. Uh, oftentimes there were seven in number uh, in the, uh, the Babylonian stories, uh, but they were entities uh, that were not from this world. They, they were entities that... Uh, were foreign to humanity until that point, um, but they were also punished, uh, later punished, and uh, sent back to the Apsu uh, from whence they came, or the, uh, the underwater uh, domain of uh, the abyss, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, that's where we get the word. A, exactly, that's where we get the word. There, there is a strong correlation, and uh, undoubtedly the uh, Akalu are the fallen angels, are the watchers. And um, that's what I see in the book of Revelation. I see um, these entities uh, that get called uh, demonic locusts um, who come up out of the abyss and, uh, you know, cause chaos upon the earth. And uh, some says, well, doesn't Scripture say they're locked away until, until judgment? Uh, that's often a, a pushback that we may get. Um, but I would argue that uh, there's no contradiction there at all. Um, eschatology, the end of times, is the uh, uh, initiation of judgment. Uh, judgment is more than just, all right, you go to the left, you go to the right. Um, you depart into everlasting fire, you depart into uh, you know eternal bliss. Uh, judgment is a sequence of events uh, that will take place upon the earth. And so they are reserved under gloomy chains of darkness until um, those sequence of events uh, begin. And Revelation sees their release from the abyss. And uh, I do a lot of investigation into uh, the connection between First Enoch and Babylon. There's been, as you know, Derek, for for many years, there's debate as to who wrote First Enoch. Um, and there's early church fathers who said that, uh, well, Enoch wrote First Enoch, the uh, biblical character Enoch, and it survived the flood on the ark. Uh, there are many who don't hold that view that uh, Enoch wrote the book of First Enoch, that uh, it was a second temple uh, production. 
Mm -hmm. uh, maybe written by various authors. One thing I see, I don't have all the answers, I know that, but one thing I see is there are Babylonian uh, pattern, there's Babylonian patterning that is going on in the book of Enoch. And so it could be the case, Derek, that who wrote the book of Enoch was uh, someone that was shooting at uh, Babylonian literature and that was conflating the uh, Babylonian Akkalu and the, uh, you know, the other gods of Babylon uh, and reframing that uh, from a, to, to a Jewish perspective. Okay. And we're not saying that they were being creative and making stuff up. We're simply saying they were uh, setting the story straight uh, because we believe that uh, Genesis 6, 1 through 4 actually happened. Uh, so did the Babylonians. They had a different viewpoint of it. They were venerating uh, these gods. Mm -hmm. But the Jewish understanding is that they were evil. They are not to be venerated. They are not to be honored. And so it could be the case, and I, again, pull out some data from Enoch, to show that there is some mirroring going on, even with uh, not just uh, the entities, but also in uh, the structure of First Enoch, the way in which it's written, uh, the way the uh, chapters are laid out on page 131 in my book. I talk about a, uh, a story or a document called the Marduk Ea, um, and there is literary patterning going on uh, between uh, that document in First Enoch six through eleven, and I won't go into detail here, but there seems to be, uh, you know, a design mm -hmm. uh, to mirror that particular uh, document. But that that ahead. is really really interesting, and I see that you cite the work of a researcher named Henry uh, or Henri Dronel, who is uh, a respected scholar of Enochic literature. This is this is really interesting, and this would. Uh, uh, be consistent with the conclusions of the Estonian scholar Amar Anus, who argued, um, I think back around 2010 in his paper on the origin of the Watchers, connecting the Apkalu to the Watchers of Enochic literature and describing the uh, the Book of Enoch and other Second Temple literature as polemic against these culture heroes of uh, Sumer, Babylon, Akkad, um, saying, yeah, we, we know who these characters are, but they're not good. They're evil. Yeah. And, he, and even among the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Akkadians, they understood that these characters could be sometimes evil and dangerous as um, sorcerers and, and that sort of thing. Uh, what is interesting in the Marduk Ea literary pattern, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to digging into this, um, Marduk being the king of the pantheon who supplanted Enlil at the top of the uh, the Mesopotamian pantheon around the time of Saul, David, and Solomon, 11th century, 10th century BC, uh, Marduk was elevated to the top of the pantheon as Babylon emerged, uh, re-emerged as a power in Mesopotamia. But Ea was the Akkadian name of uh, Enki, who was the god who ruled the city of Eridu over the Abzu or the Apsu, from which the Apkalu were sent forth. Uh, the Apsu, the Abzu, the underwater um, abyss, the freshwater source of the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Mesopotamians believed. Uh, and in fact, the word uh, Apkalu in Akkadian means big water man. <laughs> so uh, they came from the abyss. And in uh, one Babylonian text, the Epic of Era, which is the, the war god who just goes crazy and destroys everything, uh, the god Marduk says, I sent the craftsman, the Apkalu, to the Apsu and told them never to return. So you even get that aspect, of, as you say, the Babylonians understood Genesis 6 was a real event. It's just they had a different perspective. They had the fake news version of what actually happened. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, uh, yeah, it is interesting seeing that the uh, the literary pattern of this Marduk Ea text paralleled in First Enoch which again is a polemic against the Mesopotamian conception or Babylonian conception of these um, almost like Prometheus type figures, you know, from Greek mythology, the, the uh, Titan who stole fire from Olympus and gave it to humanity and was punished by Zeus for taking the sacred fire. 
it's a sort of it's the same sort of thing. They they brought as the Watchers did in the Book of First Enoch this forbidden knowledge. It wasn't just that they created the monstrous giants; they taught us sorcery and things we weren't supposed to know. And for this, they were punished. It's like you had two separate uh, villains in that story in First Enoch: Shemiyaza, who was the chief of the Watchers, but then you had uh, uh, Azael or Azazel who taught us all this forbidden knowledge. And um, the, they seem to be the two ringleaders of this uh, this rebellion. Um, I, I want to get to the four horsemen of the apocalypse because you have an interesting take on this. Sharon and I, uh, in our book, Giants, Gods, and Dragons, identified the four horsemen as um, characters from Greek mythology since the fourth horseman is identified as Thanatos, the god of death, uh, and he's followed by Hades. So we we started thinking, okay, well, who are the other three then? If those were from Greek mythology or Greek religion, and so we came up with Apollo as the rider on the white horse, the rider on the red horse, the war god Ares, Mars, uh, seemed like a pretty simple uh, one-to-one correlation there. The rider on the black horse, we believe, is Hermes or uh, Nabu in Babylonian, the god of um, scribes and accounts and uh, commerce. Uh, it was where you get the name Mercury, the Roman version of it is from the same root as commerce and commercial and merchant. Um, but you've got a different take. And I think this is really interesting. Who do you see as the four horsemen of the apocalypse? So like I do throughout the book, uh, I look for Babylonian threads and there's, uh, of course the passage, which talks about the, uh, the four horsemen and there's some other passages that talk about, uh, astrology or astral images in the sky. And there was a, an ancient document that was the, uh, the standardization of reading the stars in the ancient world. And it was the Enuma Anu Enlil. And uh, for, for a long time, I mean, this, this understanding that was put forth in the Enuma Anu Enlil, uh, it taught man when you see this in the sky, do this or think this or know this is happening. And so there were over 7,000 uh, scenarios uh, put forth in the Enuma Anu Enlil. And essentially it associated certain deities with certain events. And so in certain colors and certain constellations and certain directions. And so we say, OK, um, if we plug in the data Uh, and we compare what we're seeing in the book of Revelation, um, how will this play out? And so uh, that's exactly what uh, I consider in the book. And uh, we'll just kind of take this, you know, one by one. You asked, you know, who who do you think these individuals are? And uh, for example, uh, let's consider the color of the black horse, the rider on the black horse just for a minute. Uh, I looked and behold, there was a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. Uh, well, according to the Enuma Anu Enlil, the uh, standardization of reading the stars, and interpreting these omens, uh, black, the color black is associated with uh, the planet uh, Saturn. It is associated with the uh, deity Ninurta mm. and the constellation Scorpio. And it comes from the West, the Western direction. And so that's very interesting because we just read in Revelation that uh, it had a pair of scales in its hand. Well, that's what Scorpio has, uh, essentially a claw on each side, uh, which could be viewed as, you know, scales. Um, you you continue down and you see some other ones. Uh, uh, for example, uh Nurgle, uh, Nurgle was the uh, king of the netherworld, connected with wild animals, death, and pestilence. And we see in the in you know, Revelation there was a pale horse, um, and the name of him who sat on was death. And Hades followed him. He had power over fourth of the earth. Was given him to kill with a sword, with hunger, with death, and my beast of the earth. And so, per the Enuma Anu Enlil, um, the rider uh, of the uh, Pale horse would be uh, Nurgle, if I'm, mm-hmm. I may have misspoke a minute ago. Um, and so, you know, one by one, we began to look at these. I'll just kind of go, you know, recap here. The pale horse would be Nurgle. Black would be Nurta. 
the rider of the red horse would be uh, Nabu, and the rider on the white horse is Marduk. And this is very important because a lot of people see the four horsemen, uh, three demonic and one, we're not really sure. He's on a white horse, so he must be, um, must be a good, good guy yeah. Playing, yeah, playing a bad role. And one thing we see throughout the book of Revelation is it's Marduk versus the Messiah. Hmm. We see it uh, here. Uh, we see it uh, with the concept of uh, no more sea, no more cosmic sea of chaos in the new heavens and new earth. We'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, Marduk was the uh, the chief god of the uh, Babylonian pantheon, uh, as you alluded to earlier. And uh, he was seen as a savior figure who conquered chaos uh, defeated the uh, chaos dragon Tiamat mm -hmm. and uh, was crowned king of the gods at Babylon. And so if we're shooting at Babylon in Revelation and we're trying to dismantle them, why would you not want to dismantle them from the top down? And so Marduk uh, would be the rider on the white horse there and who represents uh, the constellation uh, Taurus and who is coming from the direction from the east. And so, again, there seems to be a pattern that seems to be very consistent and very accurate um, that when we plug in the details that John saw into the uh, ancient Enuma Anu Enlil, which was a set of 70 tablets uh, that were recovered, uh, we see that there are obvious entities that are named. And so that's exactly what I set forth in the book. And if... Uh, folks want to study that more in depth, they can certainly do that in the book. But uh, long, long and short of it, that's the answer. Uh, you're, there, there are four Babylonian deities um, that John sees. Uh, and it makes sense because Babylon the Great's the enemy, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, And uh, yeah. when you compare the, the pantheon of, of Mesopotamia with the pantheon of Greece and Rome, there's some, uh, some pretty clear correlations. Nergal was the uh, entity known in Greece and Rome as Apollo. Nabu, as I mentioned, is Mercury or Hermes. And um, uh, the, the, so, you know, Marduk, I, I'm not sure there's a direct correlation there. He had storm god attributes, but there was another storm god whose logogram in Sumerian was identical to that of uh, Hadad or Adad, which is Baal of the Bible. So there, there may be uh, some warring between the storm gods taking place there between uh, Greece and uh and Persia, but that could be the Prince of Greece, Prince of Persia uh, war. There are some who think that uh, Ahura Mazda of Zoroastrianism is just sort of a, a renamed Marduk, but that's, that's a whole rabbit trail for a, another, another day. Um, the, the bottom line here then is, is what, as we see all of this, this horrific uh, imagery that is prophesied by John, that, uh, you know, the, the massive earthquakes, the, this, uh, that, that, uh, will will destroy the uh, a good part of the earth. Uh, you know, a third of the sea uh, turned to blood in the rivers, and it just you know uh, massive stones falling from the heavens and so on. Uh, th this sounds like a really awful thing in the future. I mean, to to uh, that that is coming to the earth to, to the point where Armageddon is now sort of a catch all term for anything that's really really awful. Um, ignoring the cultural religious context of that word where it actually derives from a Hebrew phrase that means Mount of Assembly, which That's would right. be in the context of scripture would be Zion, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. But um, how does this all play out? Where, where do we as Christians find any good news in this? Well, we find good news because we're on the winning side. <laughs> um, that's, that's, you know, most obvious. Um, but, you know, we're not promised, uh, you know, a life of ease on this earth. Um, we're, uh, in fact, we should anticipate uh, persecution. Uh, and we experienced that and have experienced that for thousands of years in different forms, uh, different degrees. Uh, but in the end, uh, I think we find satisfaction eternally because of what, you know, we see towards the end of the book of Revelation. And that's, you know, this engine of chaos uh, will be no more. And the sea of chaos will be no more. Uh, th there was a, uh, 
a bronze sea, if you will, uh, that was in the uh, the Temple of Solomon. Uh, but it, there was also a twin sea that sat in the Temple of Marduk, just like it. Hmm. And uh, in both temples, uh, the sea represented, again, the Sea of Chaos. Um, and in the Marduk Temple, of course, it's there because Marduk, was crowned king of the gods at Babylon because he defeated chaos and uh, was crowned king of the gods at Babylon. And so we see Yahweh, again, fighting on all fronts and putting one in his own temple to show that he is the god of the sea who conquers uh, chaos. But uh, one of the, the things that I talk about in the book, and it's toward, toward the end of the book, uh, I believe in the last chapter, is the fact that there is a another shot against Marduk that I believe is there. It may be subtle, but I, I believe it's there, and, and I believe it's there throughout the book, and I highlight that. But essentially, Marduk rearranged the cosmos uh, when he defeated Chaos, uh, the Chaos dragon Tiamat, when he uh, defeated the sea. He recreated, if you will, uh, a new heavens and new earth in his in his legend. Um, he created, recreated the cosmos. And one thing we see in the book of Revelation is we see that the Messiah, the other entity that rides on the, another white horse, um, gets credit for destroying the sea in the book of Revelation. Um, a sea which was present in Genesis 1-2, where the Spirit of God arrested or conquered the chaotic waters. Uh, there in Genesis 1-2, uh, the word is to home mm -hmm. in the Hebrew, and uh, many believe that uh, connects to uh, Tiamat. And so we see that uh, God is very much interested in tying up that loose end. Marduk, what you, do, what you do, I can do better. And so we see in the book of Revelation, the Messiah uh, riding on the white horse on the other side of Marduk, who also rides on the white horse. And we see him conquering the sea. But then we see that the Messiah will create a new heavens and new earth. And so one thing I'm angling for in the book is that, hey, not to get into a debate of literal versus figurative, I'll let others hash that out. But could it be that there is a polemic going on in the end of Revelation that defeats Babylon's great and powerful god Marduk? I believe so. I believe mm -hmm. that the uh, new heavens and new earth, at least in part, is a, uh, a poke in the eye to uh, king of the gods at Babylon. Uh, who was crowned because of his supposed victory. And uh, you asked, how does it end? Well, it ends with uh, the Messiah uh, reigning on top, uh, being the true king of the gods and delving out punishment uh, where it is due. And uh, so that's how it ends. It ends with really the way that the world began. The world began uh, by God conquering chaos and the world will end with God conquering chaos. And um, we are the redeemed of the Messiah, the, uh, the army of the Messiah as his church. And so uh, our, uh, you know, Messiah will lead us into victory. Uh, and that's a comforting sight and a comforting thought, uh, whether we are alive to see that or not. Uh, we will be alive with the Messiah uh, for all of eternity. Amen. And so uh, for me, that is the most comforting uh, point of the book. Amen. Yes, these other Elohim are real. Many of them have aligned themselves against us and God and his creation. And uh, we, as part of his creation, are on uh, the enemy's side as far as these fallen or lesser Elohim are concerned. But uh, the Bible is all about how uh, God is redeeming us and rescuing us from uh, from these these rebels. And I, I like this interpretation 
Uh, this is a polemic against Marduk. Uh, we're on the same page regarding the uh, the role of chaos in all of this. Uh, Genesis 1 verse 2 with uh, Tahom and uh, Tiamat being essentially cognates of one another. And uh, the sea is no more. I saw a new heaven and new earth and the sea was no more. Why, why mention that separately from the new earth? You'd think mm-hmm. that the sea would just be part of the, you know, the whole package. No, right. the sea representing primordial chaos is the Hebrew word for sea in the Old Testament, yam, is the Canaanite name for Leviathan. Right. So we, and in Psalm 74, you divided yam by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. And right there, you've got another polemic against the uh, the Babylonian Enuma Elish and their creation story, where Marduk is the one who took Tiamat and created the heavens and the earth from the carcass of Tiamat. Um, the psalmist saying right there is like, no, 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 no. Yahweh did that and gave the body for, you know, d- did not create creation from chaos, subdued it, and then gave it as food to creatures in the wilderness. So, um, yeah, fascinating stuff. And I look forward to it. There's a lot of scholarship in this book, but it's very accessible and readable. And um, I just look One forward word. to be, being able to have time to read for pleasure instead of just reading specific to the work, the book I'm trying to write, but uh, your right. concluding thought. Yeah. One more, one more thing I would like to say, um, we, you know, kind of been talking about Marduk and I wanted to bring this up. Uh, the book does get, you know, dip into astral prophecy. And, and one of the prophecies is um, in revelation 12, yes. um, which, you know, where it shows the Messiah being birthed and the dragon, you know, trying to devour it. And, uh, the late Dr. Michael S. Heiser uh, did some extensive work, and um, he came up with uh, the date September 11th, 3 BC, based on the uh, the astral signs in the sky. Um, and so one thing I talked about in the book is, again, why the book of Tishri, or why, why not the book, why the month of Tishri, excuse me. Um, well, the, uh, the Babylonian calendar... Uh, mirrors that of the Jewish calendar, at least, uh, uh, you know, one particular set of the Jewish calendar. And uh, the month Tishri uh, in the Jewish calendar is uh, Tashri 2 in the Babylonian calendar. And I started investigating, okay, uh, what happened during that month uh, that might have a cosmic significance to it? Um, And so, Sure enough, uh, there was a lot uh, of very important things that happened in ancient Babylon in uh, the month Tishri or Tashri II. One of which is uh, the annual Akitu festival. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, it was a time for the gods to decree fates and uh, for the reign of earthly kings to be renewed or struck down. It was also momentous for Marduk. Uh, king of the gods at Babylon. And essentially, ancient texts reveal that for the Akitu festival in Babylon, Marduk would leave his temple and convene in the holy Akitu chapel outside the city's walls with his bands of lesser gods. And on the fourth day of the festival, the priests recited the Enuma Elish, which describes Marduk's victory over the chaos monster Tiamat. And on day five, the uh, priests reenacted the uh, Enuma Elish, and Marduk went back to his temple where he was re-enthroned as a patron uh, deity, king of the gods of Babylon. And so there's some other events that happen in that month uh, as well. And I'll talk about those in the book. Um, but the point is that um, the fact that astrologers, you know, from the East, let these Babylonian astrologers uh, left uh, that particular part of the world, the, they were pagan priests is what they were. They left that part of the world, uh, which was a very busy month uh, in honoring Marduk and these other gods. They left, they left that and came to lay gifts at the uh, feet of the Messiah. And uh, that is incredible, especially when you understand uh, maybe some responsibility that they had. Uh, in their former lands, uh, customs that they uh, undoubtedly would still right. participate in. So, anyways, I just wanted to say that that they're. Uh, I, I hope your your listeners will you know get the book, check it out, and look for those uh, Babylonian threads in the Book of Revelation. 
Yeah, so. and and the fact that that uh, those seeds were planted in the time of Daniel more than five hundred years before the birth of Jesus. So uh, it's almost as though this is uh, the as Chuck Missler used to call it an integrated message system from outside our time space domain, the Bible that is. Uh, it all fits together. You cannot separate the book of Revelation from the rest of Scripture and the Old You can't understand Revelation unless you understand the Old Testament. You can. Yeah. Perfect, can. And uh, giving the uh, cultural context and religious context in which the Hebrew prophets lived and the apostles lived uh, helps uh, understand, as Mike Heiser said, surprise, surprise, the Hebrew prophets read books and they knew what their neighbors believed. And a lot of what's in Scripture is right. polemic against those beliefs. Tyler Gilraith, the author of the new book, Gate of the Gods from Defender Publishing. Uh, this is going up on the 14th of April. And as you're watching this, it'll be just a few weeks ahead of the broadcasts on Skywatch TV with uh, Tyler and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis. That'll be a fascinating panel. I'm looking forward to sitting on that, um, which, of course, will already have happened by the time you are watching this, since we're time shifting this into the future. But uh, I would encourage you, you can get the book at uh, Amazon, of course, or any bookstore, but I would encourage you to watch and wait for the Skywatch TV special because I know that there will be a special package offer for Tyler's book where you can get it and uh, probably Colonel McGinnis's book as well. Um, and uh, that would be at skywatchtvstore.com. But uh, do watch for those programs. And uh, Tyler, uh, look forward to seeing you, which again, as people are watching this, will already have happened. So it was nice to have seen you, even though it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Good to see you, Derek. I appreciate it. Good morning. Links to Gate of the Gods and Tyler's previous book, Gospel Over Gods, in the notes below, whether you're watching or listening to this program. Uh, by the way, he was just in the Ozarks here Friday. He was here for uh, shooting four programs with Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis for Skywatch TV, the two of their books, um, uh, Bob McGinnis's new book on the UFO phenomenon which is really going to be interesting coming from his perspective. He's got access to sources inside the Pentagon that we don't have. Uh, watch for those upcoming on Skywatch TV. And uh, also, as I said, you can, uh, if you want to wait and to take advantage of the special offer coming when those programs air on Skywatch TV, you will get a good deal on both of those books. Highly recommended. And I will have uh, Colonel McGinnis back on the program to talk about his book uh, in the uh, near future. Coming up, uh, <laughs> You know, normally I really like Tucker Carlson, but this week he really stepped in it as, uh, well, I'll explain why straight ahead. And this could be your last chance to sign up for our solidarity mission to Israel as we wait for the other shoe to drop vis-a-vis -vis Iran. More straight ahead as a view from the bunker continues. Summer reading season is just around the corner. We want to help you get ready. You can buy fiction, you can buy nonfiction through the Gilbert House store, whichever you want. All of our books are 40% off, 40%. That includes all eight novels of the Red Wing mm -hmm. Saga. Book nine is coming, probably early summer. My two novels, and then of course, all of our nonfiction stuff, mm -hmm. including our most recent books, Giants, Gods, and Dragons, The Second Coming of Saturn, and Veneration, a deep dive into the cult of the Nephilim. April and May, you get 62 days, Absolutely. no, 61. That's, April only has 30. <laughs> Regardless, through the end of May, 40% off on all of our books at the Gilbert House store. Available only online. Go to gilberthouse.org slash store. You'll find all the prices slashed on our books. 40% off. gilberthouse.org slash store. And thank you for your prayers and support. <laughs> Driving the internet to think. This is a view from the bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. You'll find us online at vftb.net. That's the podcast homepage, the web hub for everything we do. Gilberthouse.org, gilberthouse.org, my personal website, Derek P. Gilbert. Dot com or on social media, X, formerly Twitter, at View From Bunker or at Derek Gilbert. Facebook, View From the Bunker, Truth Social, get me, we get her at Derek P. Gilbert, also on threads, but who cares? Uh, on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Gilbert House. And if you're watching there, thank you. Thank you. Please subscribe, click the bell for notifications, and then please guarantee that we never get canceled. Yes, cancel-proof yourself. 
by downloading our free app, the Gilbert House Ministries app, or GHTV, if you will. You'll find it uh, for iOS, Android, Amazon, Kindle Fire phones and tablets. They've also got uh, Roku, Apple TV versions. And coming very, very soon, we've submitted it now for approval, the Fire TV version. So all of the video content will be uh, easily available on your big screen. The advantage to the mobile app is that it brings it into your smartphone or tablet, but also features a couple of extra uh, functions that I think are really useful. One is a Bible. Of course, multiple translations, and it's an audio Bible, so you can listen while you sleep, while you're driving, what have you. Uh, when you get bored of listening to us, just flip over, listen to the Bible, listen to some scripture. But there's also a messaging section, which is a, almost a self-contained social media site where you can communicate, share with other like-minded believers, and do it offline, off of the main internet, if you will. And uh, there's a lot of activity in the prayer request section, and uh, we really, really appreciate that. You'll find that at gilberthouse.org slash app. gilberthouse.org slash app. There's also a link at vftb.net. Just check the top menu bar there for the link. Well, uh, Tucker Carlson this week interviewed a, uh, a pastor from Bethlehem. He's an evangelical Lutheran pastor, uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Munther Isaac. And... Um, Tucker's takeaway from the interview with, is that we Western Christians who are in support of Israel have lost the plot, that if we aren't upset and angry at Israel's destruction in the Gaza Strip, then we have lost the plot. We are not, the implication being we are not true followers of Jesus Christ if we are not condemning Israel for what's happening in Gaza. Uh, it... <laughs> was a bit surprising to those of us who may not have followed Tucker Carlson as closely as some others. I saw a really good breakdown of this, uh, two actually, this past week, one by the Israel guys, uh, the Israel guys who, by the way, have a uh, conference coming up in May. You might check them out because uh, Caroline Glick, who wrote a really good analysis of what's going on in the Gaza Strip for the Jewish News Service last week, talked about it on Skywatch TV. Um, she will be one of the speakers at their conference. And then another by Olivier Melnick and John Haller, who's been a guest on this program previously. John Haller does a weekly prophecy update from their uh, church in uh, the Columbus, Ohio area, which I highly recommend. It basically, a look at the news of the day and the prophetic implications, or news of the week, I should say. He does it every Sunday and puts it out on YouTube, and uh, it is really, really excellent. John is an attorney, very sharp, very insightful. Olivier Melnick also very sharp, and the two of them essentially broke down what uh, Tucker said with the uh, Reverend Dr. Isaac um, and pointed out that uh, it's kind of an open secret amongst those who know Tucker Carlson well that he is not pro-Israel, and it really has never been. It's just that when he was at Fox News, he just never talked about Israel because uh, for the most part, the Fox News hosts are pro-Israel. Tucker is not. He just avoided the subject. Well, he brought Reverend Dr. Isaac on, and I have not followed the Christ at the Checkpoint conferences. I was aware of them, was not aware that Dr. Or Reverend Dr. Isaac was uh, the coordinator of these conferences. He is a, uh, an Arab uh, an Arab Christian in Bethlehem, who is um, on October 8th, in other words, the day after the deadly attack that left 1,200 Israelis dead and a couple hundred more dragged off to Gaza, he said this in his sermon, in his sermon, a day after the attack, quote, what is happening is an embodiment of the injustice that has befallen us as Palestinians from the Nakba until now. If you're not familiar with that term, Nakba, that means catastrophe, which is the label that they've given the Declaration of Independence by Israel in 1948, May of 1948. So because of the injustice that they've suffered at the hands of Israel for the last 75 plus years, what happened on October 7th was understandable. Uh, excuse me, thou shalt not murder? Um... <laughs> Anyway, um, he went on to, um, well, he, he has gone on in, in many other sermons and speeches, conference presentations at the Christ at the Checkpoint conferences, um, in basically supporting the approach of Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Fatah, the Palestinian Authority against Israel. There, there's, a, there's a lot of racial 
as well as religious tension in that part of the world. Arabs hate the Jews. The Jews hate the Arabs. Arabs hate the Turks. Turks hate the Arabs. Turks hate the Persians. Persians hate the Arabs. Arabs hate the Persians. There's a lot going on over there that has nothing to do with Jews and Christians. It is racial and nationalistic as much as it is religious, although the religious aspect of it runs very, very deep. And it's, it's a very old, old conflict. The Jews and Arabs were fighting each other, have been fighting each other in that part of the world for more than 2,000 years. Really, probably since the time of Abraham, um, or shortly thereafter anyway, within a couple of generations of Abraham, once we actually had a Jewish people, but the Israelites and the Arabs were in conflict, especially in the South. Um, look, the Christ at the Checkpoint conflict or, or, or conferences are, are often very critical of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, Judaism, Zionism, Christians who support Israel, but they never say anything about the Quran, the teachings of Muhammad, or the Palestinian Authority paying the families of terrorists for, who are, you know, who are imprisoned for, for committing uh, violent acts up to and including murder. This is who the Reverend Dr. Isaac is. And the irony is that he pastors a church in Bethlehem where the Christian population has shrunk from about 70% of the population of the town of Bethlehem back in the 1950s. So in other words, within 10 years of Israel becoming an independent state, Bethlehem was 70% Christian. It is now less than 12% Christian today. And here's the clue. Uh, according to the Christian charity Open Doors, that decline is not due to Islamic oppression or not due to Jewish persecution. It is Islamic oppression. Palestinian Arabs who convert and follow Jesus Christ have a harder time from their Muslim neighbors than they do from Israeli Jews. This is a fact. So... Christians who are being told that we should not support Israel because they're persecuting Palestinian Christians need to step back and say, okay, look, in the Middle East as a whole, in the Middle East as a whole, and this is according to a uh, report published in 2019 by then Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt of the United Kingdom, the percentage of Christians in the Middle East has dropped from about 20% of the population there a century ago. And let's, you know, go back 1,400 years, and it was mostly Christian. <laughs> it, was, it was reduced to 20% because of, you know, like uh, 17, 1,300 years of Islamic warfare. 20% um, of the Middle East was Christian a century ago. It is now down below 5%. And in the Palestinian territories, it's like 1.5%. Again, it's not because of Jewish persecution. It is because of Islamic oppression. And for Christian pastors like Munther Isaac to take the position that he does shows that he cares more about his Arab nationalistic beliefs than he does about faith in Jesus Christ. And Tucker Carlson should know better. Bless your pointy little head. Well, we've got uh, a number of events coming up. The uh, Skywatch TV virtual conference continues. You still get 90 days access to all of the conference presentations, including Tom Horn's final presentation for Skywatch TV. And as a free bonus, all six Skywatch Films documentaries, DefenderConference.com to sign up for that. The Prophetic Science in the Heavenlies Conference. We just came back from Dallas last weekend, um, saw the total eclipse in Dallas on Monday. That was spectacular. Wouldn't have traveled to Dallas just for the eclipse, but uh, since we were there for the conference anyway, yes, it was spectacular. So that's two total eclipses now I've seen. I've seen both of the two uh, in the last seven years, and hey, we're still here. Thank you, Lord. Um, as we are still waiting for that other shoe to drop from Iran, however, in Israel, we, uh, you know, always say, uh, God willing, we'll be here again next week. Never take any anything for granted. Um because we are definitely living in prophetic times, that is for sure. You can still get access to the streaming video, and I encourage you to do that because there were some really powerful messages there. My presentation was on the, uh, not the eclipse, but the prophetic sign in the heavenlies, the uh, winter solstice of 2020, the great conjunction or what astrologers call the great mutation. From a Christian perspective, 
our lives are not controlled by the movement of the planets in the sky, but there are some very wealthy, very powerful people who do think so, and that explains why they've done what they've done, we think, over the last three years. You can see that along with presentations from Colonel David Giamona, that was powerful. Pastor Casper McLeod, always, always worth hearing from. David Hevner, Dr. Kerry Made, uh, Dave Hodges, Michael Bodea, Tavros, and more, and uh, you'll get all of that when you sign up. Uh, you go to hearthewatchmen.com to uh, get more. Hearthewatchmen.com. Next on the calendar, the Mysteries of the Bible Verse Conference, as far as conferences anyway. That's coming up early June, June 7th and 8th at... Uh, the Marriott Cincinnati Airport. That's actually in Hebron, Ohio, uh, right there across the, basically across the highway from the airport. Uh, Rudy Landa, who is the uh, director and producer of the documentary Angels and Giants that featured Doug Van Dorn. He'll be one of the featured speakers. I'll be speaking twice at this conference. Uh, Pastor Mike Hoggard will be there. We'll also get to meet, uh, well, Micah Van Hus, who's been a recent uh, guest on this program. Uh, last week's guest, he will be one of the speakers. Greg Patton, Josh Davis, Mike or Mac Dominic, excuse me, and uh, we hope we see you there as well. If you're anywhere in northern Kentucky or southern Ohio, please join us. The Mysteries of the Bible Verse Conference, June seventh and eighth at Cincinnati. More information at SWRC Southwest Radio Church. SWRC. Dot com. June 21st through 23rd, Sharon and I hosting a, well, we're not hosting it, but we will be featured at a, a conference for His Call Ministries, basically just the two of us speaking Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday morning at uh, the Finley River Ranch just south of Springfield in Sparta, Missouri. Uh, we will, uh, we're, the theme of the conference will be the gates of hell. Why did Jesus go there to declare his divinity? Where do we find them? How do we open them? I mean, not that we want to, but how do people open them? That's sort of a general question. Um, we'll, that, that will be the theme of the conference, June 21st through 23rd. Uh, I don't want anybody thinking, I'm so, you know, we're going to give you a formula for doing it. No, don't do it. <laughs> but there are people out there trying to, and again, that has some explanatory power as to what's uh, going on in the world around us today. For more information, go to hiscallministries.com, hiscallministries.com. Dot com and reserve your spot. Uh, the Go Therefore Conference in late July, Brookville, Ohio. Pastor Neil Peterson's church, the Harvest Revival Center, will be there with L.A. Marzulli, Pastor Paul Begley, Pastor Carl Gallops, Dr. Judd Burton, and more. Of course, Dr. Mike Spaulding putting this on, and uh, we hope you join us there. Streaming video for this one is also available July 26th and 27th, Go Therefore Conference. Dot com And uh, in September, the Pitchfork and Ho Gathering, Valley City, North Dakota, the Eagles Club there. Wonderful facility, a great gathering. It's sort of like a, uh, like a seminar, a weekend seminar, uh, different uh, workshops on best practices for small, uh, small farmers, really. Um, and then I'll be speaking a couple of times on uh, just uh, strange, probably talking about what we've got in our forthcoming book, The Gates of Hell. So that'll be uh, September 6th and 7th this year, Valley City, North Dakota. A little earlier in the season, so hopefully we won't be hit with the weather that we got last October in Valley City, North Dakota. Um, more information at the uh, Pitchfork and Ho Gathering Facebook page. You'll find a link at our website, gilberthouse.org. Also, uh, just check the calendar at our mobile app, and all of the information is there. Now, I mentioned that uh, this may be your last chance to sign up for our um, our planned solidarity mission to Israel, May 6th through 13th. We've got to make a decision here soon. We will likely do that this coming week. Um, normally, this would be way late to try to get hotel reservations, but according to Aaron Lipkin, as you might expect in Israel, given that they've been uh, in a state of war for the last six months, the hotels are not nearly as filled as they would be. So uh, we are, we've extended this to try to Get uh, more folks signed up, more brave souls willing to journey with us to Israel, visit these communities in the south that were attacked October 7th, go to Tel Aviv, visit Hostage Square, uh, spend some time in, in Jerusalem at the holy sites that you want to see, like the Temple Mount, the Mount of Olives, the Western Wall, and more. A couple of museums on the, uh, several museums, in fact, on the uh, itinerary, including uh, the one at Gush Etzion, which is south of Jerusalem. It was the site of a... Uh, a massacre in 1948 that essentially is Israel's Alamo. It is powerful. This would be a powerful week. We just want to go there, see things with our own eyes, without the filter of the Western media, and uh, report back. 
and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. For more information, gilberthouse.org slash travel. gilberthouse.org slash travel. It's also where you'll find information on our tour next spring. The Iron and Myth Tour of Israel, Doug Van Dorn, Dr. Judd Burton, and Timothy Alberino joining us as special guests March 25th through April 3rd of 2025. More information, again, at gilberthouse.org slash travel. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to watch or listen wherever you may be consuming this podcast. Again, if it's uh, YouTube, God bless you. Subscribe, share, and uh, then cancel proof yourself by downloading our app. If you're listening, whether it's at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, which will soon be uh, rolled into YouTube music, I am told, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, uh, Spreaker, and uh, Pandora now, um, thank you. Uh, appreciate you giving us a uh, good review at one of those sites. Um, our announcer, the inimitable DC Good, and a view from the bunker is a production of Gilbert House Ministries, released under Creative Commons Attribution, not commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Good night, Oliver, wherever you are. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is a view from the bunker.